for the past five years, there's not been many defenders across Supercoach and AFL Fantasy that have had the level of scoring consistency of Tom Stewart. But as we enter into 2024, is he about to do it all again? Or are we about to see something change in his role? and his scoring prospects for 2024. He's number 18 in my 50 most relevant. And joining me on this episode as he has ever since the coaches panel began and right throughout this season, you've loved the insight you've got from him. Rids, nice to see. And on this episode, Tom's a really interesting guy to talk about. He's a gun, mate. Let's not beat around the bush. He's a gun. Plain and simple, he's a star. Let's dive into this 2023 season a little bit. A seasonal average of 113.6 in Supercoach means in that format he's priced at just over 635,000. 16 tons last year, a top score of 167, a career high much higher than that. It's up at a 187. A seasonal average of 96.3 in AFL Fantasy consisting of 12 tons. $888,900 $888,900 is what he'll set you back in DT and just $869,000 in AFL Fantasy. 133 was the top score for that year, but a 169 is a career high. If you've played fantasy football, let alone just watched the game of AFL over the past four to five years, you're very aware about the accomplishments and the skill set of Tom Stewart. Beautiful reader of the footballer. When he gets opportunity in space, and even when he doesn't, aerially, he's a threat to intercept. The way he sets up and rebounds the play for Geelong is absolutely elite. He controls that back half the ground with absolute supreme leadership and abilities, and it's no surprise to anybody that yet again he's this high in the 50 most relevant. Yeah, so we don't really need to tell everyone how good he is. He's just a gun. So let's just push straight into it, okay, MJ? We got a decision to make. Yes, we do. We want Tom Stewart at some stage through the year, okay? Plain and simple. Defenders, I mean, we've got Dacos. We've got that, you know, ongoing discussion early on in the year. Do we start him? Do we wait till he's by? Blah, blah, blah. And then it's Tom Stewart. It's like there's a bit of a gap. Like everyone else, I think everyone is predicting to go regress a little bit outside of a guy called Hayden Young. So at this stage, it's absolutely pretty much locked in that he's highly likely to finish in the top six defenders for the year. But what do we do? Do we start him or do we fade him and then try and upgrade to him? And that's the interesting discussion because we've seen from years gone by, not his own fault, he does seem to be worth cheaper as the year progresses. Like whether that was last year in round one where he had an injury and he had an injury affected score, he drops a few, he hurts people who own him at the time. Or whether it was in other past seasons where he had a bit of a foot issue and everything else. Same things really happened. He's got himself subbed out for a sub 30, 40 score. And whether he got tagged, mate. There's been mm. instances he's so good that they get someone to go stand next to him. Like I think the perfect um, example was St. Kilda last year. They might have got, um, what was his name? Charman or Shaman or whatever his name is, mm-hmm. to go stand next to him through the game. Teams are starting to catch on, you know. Tom Stewart's a handy footballer. So what do we do? Do we start him? Do we upgrade? Hmm. Interesting question. That's Let's the real look at dilemma. that in a little bit. But he's not now, not now, not now, not now. I want to give you the moment because you've been biting at it. You've been just sitting there waiting to give us a whole heap of stats that everyone glazes their eyes over and go, yes, MJ's just going for a five-minute stat run. Stat man. And we're just going to let you go for it, okay? So here is your moment, mate. Over to you. All right. Here's the hot stretch of scoring that we know he can do. Just in 2022, yep, going back a further season, he goes between rounds 3 to 11 at an average of 114 in Dream Team and Fantasy and a scoring range of 93 up to 169. However, he goes at 120 over the first 10 games of 2022. The lowest has a 74 in there. It's his second lowest score of the year. Last year, between around 15 and 21 in Supercoach, he averages 124.7. 
doesn't drop a score below the ton, while in AFL fantasy over the same stretch of games, goes at 102 and just has one game where his scoring falls away under 94. So I think you're right. We can talk about the fact that pre-buy, post-buy, what do you average with injury, without injury? The reality is at some point we want Tom Stewart. So here are the questions I, I want to work our way through with you. Timing, role, fixture. Let's start at the reverse order of that because that might help us unpack a few things. That early fixture, he has no buys as opposed to others in the first six blocks of the year. If you're just getting involved in your fantasy season due to opening round, four of the first six rounds are quote-unquote compromised with a best 18, the teams that play an opening round. They are spread out over two teams with four Weak blocks where they are missing means we're in best 18 mode. So teams and premiums that play all the way through, super valuable. Geelong's one of those. Here's who they play in the first six weeks. St. Kilda, Adelaide, Hawthorne, Bulldogs, North and Brisbane. Does that fixture excite you or concern you about Tom Stewart? Well, what I did was I went into DFS Australia and I had a quick look at the fixture analysis, okay, for defenders. It absolutely excites me because what I found was three or four of them have a green tinted color to them, which means they're actually quite friendly for defenders. So I've got a question to you though. Hmm. If you've got a ceiling and you've got a friendly matchup on a round that's best 18, that's mm-hmm. buy affected and someone like a day cost isn't playing and you know, he's highly owned. Is that a good thing? or a bad thing for another guy? I think that's a very good thing. Yeah, so I sort of came to the same conclusion, okay? So I think the best way to combat the ownership numbers of a Nick Dacos and the ceiling of a Nick Dacos is to actually go, you know what, Tom Stewart is quite a handy player through that little stretch of four or five games he's got good matchups and he's got a history of 150 plus scores across all the formats i mean what else do we really need mj well there is the talk in the preseason about this geelong structure and you and i are both quite bullish we've done an episode in the 50 most relevant around cam guthrie and that we both see him as the central piece in this midfield however there is some narrative and some substance behind the preseason chatter that we might see Tom Stewart roll through the midfield. I guess my question to you is this, do you see this as a permanent maneuver, just a rounding out of his game or just a bit of a furphy in the preseason? I haven't heard one coach say we want Tom Stewart playing in the midfield. He's training with the midfield. All I've heard is guys like James Kelly come out and say, Of course, I'd love to see him there. He's a gun. I want to have my gun footballers around the ball more. Mm. Of course, everyone do. But have a look at the personnel at the Geelong Club. Asava Radiglia has gone off and gone to Port Adelaide. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty big hole in that back line. Tom Stewart has also been an All-Australian defender for multiple years now. I'm not quite sure whether the two mesh up. But who knows? It is Chris Scott. He can he can pull a rabbit out of the hat, yeah? So, I mean, if he does start midfield, though, is that a bad thing? I'm not really sure because he won't be a 100% midfielder. He'd be floating back across half back, probably getting more of those cheaper possessions anyway as he floats back. He won't have the hard tag when he's actually playing back as well. I don't think it's a bad thing either way no matter what happens. There were four games last year where Tom Stewart did attend a centre bounce. It was round, uh, one round he had 26% CBAs, went at 124 in Supercoach, 111 in Dream Team and Fantasy. That was against North Melbourne. A fortnight later, he pumps out a 116 in Fantasy, a 152 and scores at 53% CBAs. That's against Brisbane. The week later against Fremantle, a 101 in Supercoach and a 112 in Fantasy off just 9% of CBAs. So it's there, but it doesn't really count. And then there's a 72 in AFL Fantasy and a 69 in Supercoach of 12% CBAs against the Magpies. It's a four-game sample size. Only 
two of them are technically over 20%, let alone 25%, but it's a four game sample of a 102 average in AF. So arguably a pretty much what he did minus the injury affected average last year and a 111 in super coach, which is a slight regression on both his post buy stats of 119, let alone his seasonal average, which was the 113, including that injury affected 18. So when you have a look at that, he had 53% um, CBAs against Brisbane. I don't think there's a good matchup in Brisbane for him in their forward line. So I just, yeah, I could see why. Like De Conning could go to a Hipwood or a Danaher. Radigalier was there anyway. It may very well have just been a matchup thing. Like who who does he go to, a Rainer? Like, I mean, I don't see that third tall forward for Brisbane that he could work his way off and do that in the set market to get with anyway. So it may be I've missed someone. I'm sure someone will message in and tell me that I'm full. But the thing is, it's okay. There's no McStay there anymore. Years gone by, there was a McStay. He mm. could work off the um, – because that's what he does. He beats his man one-on-one and then he works off him and he actually plays his interceptive game. But I wanted to highlight something to you, mate. Please. I think he's absolutely his super coach season last year is understated a bit. And I know that's crazy. Yeah, We're talking about an absolute gun who's gone at 112. Like, it is actually understated because I think what we do is we remember Dacos, how good Dacos was. Dacos only out averaged him by four points a game. Yeah. Now, the first game last year, though, Tom Stewart had that injury-affected game where 18, he scored yeah. 18. I know Dacos had that injury-affected game later in the year, but the fact was he was on Finn anyway. He was getting soundly beaten at the time. Yeah, two I don't thirds see to three quarters a, of a game as well. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't see that being a pop score. I would argue that Tom Stewart's probably had the equivalent, if not better, SC season than what Nick Dacos did last well, year. Minus that injury affected game in Supercoach, Stewart's going at a 118. And of available defenders we've got that still sit in the defensive line, he's ranked second for total points. The only guy ahead of him was Luke Ryan, who played one extra game and it was only a 17 point differential. So you're absolutely dead on the money that he's got two monsters of over 150 plus and 11 of his tons of those 16 tons in super coach were 120 plus. So you talk about ceiling and, and an unheralded season. My word, Tom Stewart delivered that for us last year in super coach. And all I can see at the moment is I know he's owned at about 13% in AF right now. Mm-hmm. That's going to go up. I think when people start clicking on to the fact that, Dacos has got the early buy. They're waiting to see what round zero looks like before making that end decision about Dacos. But, I mean, it's an easy pivot, Dacos to a steward in AF. So why not plan to have the most expensive, guaranteed number one defender in the comp and then pivot after round zero to see how it looks? So I I think that's actually explainable and actually common sense. I'm sure there's going to be pockets of the community that are going, oh, it's a casual aspect or it's a... No, I think it's actually because Dacos is a gun. But I tell you what, Tom Stewart, mate, his ownership is going to spike before round one. There's no doubt about that, especially if he gets some CBAs in that pracky game. 100% agree with you. If you're looking at your D1 spot, and you're going, I'm concerned about Dacos and the potential buy. I'm concerned about Sicily and just the scoring volatility that could come. I'm unsure about what a Jack Sinclair might do when history is set over now a number of years. He picks up as the season goes on, and with more games at Marvel Stadium, that's the time to pounce. What you get with Stewart is a guy that when you put him all up in the wash, you know he's going to be a top 10 defender by points and by average injuries pending you know that on his day he's got not just a very good ceiling but arguably the best ceiling available to us of all current known defenders for us and that early fixture of St Kilda, Adelaide, Hawthorne and the Bulldogs those four 
are some of the best in Supercoach and AFL fantasy using 2023 data. So could he come out of the gate and average a 120 in AFL fantasy and a 130, 135 in Supercoach? Yep, really easy. If you don't start him, totally okay. But what else are you going to do at D1? Are you taking on those buys? Are you taking on someone else that's at a higher price point with a higher risk of other elements? Or are you going completely for value? I think that's rounding those things together before we hit draft reads is really kind of the thing that coaches are still not really wrapped their arms around who and how they want to play D1 and D2 in 2024. So what I want to do is just focus on super coach again, okay? Just for one more second. From round 11 last year, I'm going to rattle off his, some of his scores. He only went under 100 twice for the year mm-hmm. from round 11. And one of them was a terrible 69 in round 22 against Collingwood. That's fine. I just want to rattle this off, mate. And you tell me if this sounds like captain, vice captain, loophole territory. 138, 127, 91, 111, 147, 124, 104, 152, 101, 134. And then he finishes the year 128 and 124. I don't want to understate this. This is the, the most, this is possibly the easiest no brainer starting super coach defender mm-hmm. in my eyes for this year. And if you're backing against him in the other formats, well, best of luck because you it's going to be an uncomfortable watch through that little six game stretch to start the year. Certainly is. That first matchup is uh, an interesting one too against St Kilda. You get that Saturday night matchup so you can take the loophole. The week after against the Crows is a Friday night, so another loophole option. And then Monday against the Hawks. If you're watching that round three, and depending on the players you've got that might be on a buy that week, you need to pop a ceiling. You're looking at where you find yourself moving in the rankings. If you play AFL Fantasy and you can watch the rankings move, He's the kind of guy you can put a captaincy on if you really want to go ballsy and do something big. To me, is Stuart someone you can upgrade to during the season? Absolutely. But there's enough indicators that point really heavily to me that if you're looking for a D1 that has got ceiling and value attached to them, just not just through a injury impacted, but just based on what he can do, to me, Tom Stewart's right in consideration. And if you haven't considered him in your starting squad, go back through as Ridge has just done. Look at the data of what he did in Supercoach and AFL Fantasy. And at very least, he needs to become a consideration, if not someone that sits at D1 or D2, come at the start of round one. On draft day, Rids, it's pretty simple. He's going to go as somebody's D1. He's a top 10 defender across all the formats, has been for the better part now of half a decade. On the premise that Nick Dacos, I think, is the universal D1 in all formats, is Stewart a clear D2 in Supercoach for you ahead of the Sicilies and Sinclairs? Or is there a bit of gap there? And then in AF, where do you see him going? D1 we know, but where in that D1 tier do you see? I think what happens is like, and I've said this a couple of times through the preseason, okay? You've got the four rucks, you've got the Dacos, whether you a McRae lover or not, or believer. I don't know how you want to term that. Um, Then there's going to be a group of mids potentially come through. So I reckon you could probably look at Tom Stewart early second round at this point in time, and you're probably going to land him there. Because I do reckon that there's going to be other players that come into those discussions at points in time, you know, say for super coach, it's going to be Stuart or Sicily or Ryan, even maybe a Sinclair, maybe Houston. Is it a Sheasel? Like there are people around without as much like deviation points um, potential. So they are in that ballpark. It's not like you're talking day costs where everyone's expecting day costs to be a bit of a gap ahead of number two. But as I've just said, I reckon Stewart is based on last year's figures is just as likely to score the same, if not very similar, especially in super coach. So for me, I would actually look at jumping 
before the mids because I think the mids have got a blanket over them this year. And I would actually try to lock in Tom Stewart as my D1 if I didn't have an early, early pick and I was choosing a Ruck or Dacos. I really like that approach. Hey, mate, as always, you give us something to think about and something to process with our structures and mindsets. Great to have you back on the 50 Most Relevant, mate. Yeah, too easy. I hope um, I was very clear. I would be starting Tom Stewart. My recommended recommendation is to do so, but go against me. See how we go. That's the beauty of the game, isn't it? We can all see things and interpret and back ourselves in. And ultimately, that's the most important thing. Do the work yourself, do the research yourself, and then back yourself in with how you want to do your team. If you want to check out the article on Tom, you can. It's online now for you at coachespanel.tv. Along with all of the other players we have done episodes on so far, the good news is if you want to read about it, you can at coachespanel.tv. You can listen to it wherever you get your podcasts from, from Spotify, Apple Music Podcasts, over there, YouTube Music, The Works. Go there, make sure you subscribe. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, leave a nice review. We'll read you out on one of these upcoming podcasts if it's a good one so make sure you throw that in there or you can watch these on youtube make sure you go over subscribe you can watch these episodes unfold and if you are watching thank you for doing so i hope you've subscribed you got the notifications on so as soon as these episodes drop live you get notified on your device but if you are watching it comment below what do you think tom stewart's going to average in 2024 If you haven't joined our Patreon supporter group, we'd love you to do it. It's just starting to warm up as we now hitting the months of February and really getting moving. If you want to join the community conversations that happen in the Patreon group, as well as a bunch of other rewards that happen during the season and through the preseason, you can find out all the details for that in the description of this episode. So who's up next in the 50 most relevant? He's a guy that if you were to do a poll in the fantasy footy community circles, I think we've all strongly considered him. There was a six-week block last year where he was unstoppable, where he was untaggable, and he was a captain option almost every single week, clearly flying past 121 average in that six-week block. But it wasn't just one hot six-week block. Really, outside of a handful of games, This premium midfielder was a phenomenon. He's already a top 10 midfielder in one format. And in another, he is banging the door down with many saying he's got the potential to be the number one scorer in a format. And yet he's got upside. And we haven't even talked about fixtures, captaincy, dynamics that hit within his side. And maybe there's a world even hit picks up some DPP. Sounds too good to be true, right? You'll find out about this premium midfielder tomorrow in the 50 Most Relevant.